Ladies and gentlemen, the ANC and specifically the Minister of Energy, Mr. Ramakhopa, has unveiled a new 2.2 trillion rand energy deal. It is kind of a revival of the old deal that already started back in 1999. This time, however, the deal looks, or the bill rather, looks a little bit different. It's going to have a mixture of different types of energy. So, for example, 11,000 megawatts will come from solar. You'll have 7,300 megawatts, megawatts from wind energy, 6,000 megawatts from gas to power, and 5,200 megawatts of new nuclear capacity. All of this, according to Ramakhopa, will cost us about 2.2 trillion rand. And once that's done, uh, South Africa's energy grid will be stable. It's, of course, based only on the amount of energy that we currently use and a little bit of foresight into where we might be somewhere in the future. But if South Africa were to achieve massive economic growth, we'd have to repeat this process every few years. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because, hey, if your economy is growing, you can afford to splurge a bit. But we're going to talk about renewables right now. And I thought... I could be the one to give you this information, but the truth is I'm not an energy expert. I have not studied energy at university, and so that would be rather silly of me. So I decided to go look, and I researched, and I read, and I watched a number of videos. Just want to start this video by saying a massive thank you to Nikki Gibbs for the 140 Rand Super Chat on the previous video. I really appreciate that. So here is Catherine Porter. She is an independent energy consultant. She has studied this. I'll allow her to explain to you why renewable energy just doesn't work. So there are two ways in which our electricity system isn't safe. And the stability problem arises because our power grid uses alternating current and renewables and batteries work on direct current. And trying to put direct current into an alternating current grid is like putting a square peg into a round hole. It's technically difficult to do. And one of the things that stabilizes the power system are conventional generators. So the way that works is to create the alternating current, you rotate one magnet inside the magnetic field of another magnet. And so you've got these magnets on the turbines and stuff. And that creates current and voltage that varies <coughs> Sorry, in a stable cycle. You have a, a nice wave. And that wave uh, is linked to the speed that the turbines rotate. So in Europe, they rotate at 3,000 revolutions per minute, and that gives you 50 cycles of your voltage and frequency uh, and current per second, and that's called the grid frequency. And it's a really, really important parameter in the electricity market. Um, equipment across the grid is very sensitive to it. And so they all have protection measures that will basically, they'll turn themselves off if that frequency goes out of whack. And it's also linked to supply and demand, a bit like water in a pipe. So if you put more water in the pipe than you take out, eventually the pressure goes up and the pipe would burst. If you put more electricity into the grid than you take off, the frequency tries to speed up. And then the opposite is true. If you're taking more out than you put in, it will slow down. And if it slows down too much, then everything turns itself off, which is basically what happened in Iberia. Mm. Everything mm. turned itself off because the frequency went outside the range that it was supposed to be in. The other thing that you get from conventional power stations is not just that they set up that nice wave in the first place. Because they're big, heavy lumps of metal, they resist changes to their speed of rotation. Mm -hmm. So if you get a reduction in generation and your demand has gone up and it's trying to lower the frequency, which would mean slowing down the turbines, well, they're not very inclined to do it. So they're providing this thing called inertia, which is basically a resistance to that change. And that makes changes slower and it then becomes less likely that stuff will be turning itself off. But as you start replacing those conventional generators with renewables, they uh, create this alternating current through electronics. The electronics don't have any inertia. They're actually quite even more sensitive than other types of equipment to frequency changes. Um, and so they can contribute to the problem. We saw that in Spain. We saw solar in particular and wind tripping off when frequency was actually still inside its operating, or what was supposed to be its operating parameters. So they 
disconnected and then that caused the frequency to drop to a level where everything else turned off because then it did go outside of their safe parameters. Renewables definitely were the cause of the Iberian blackout. And what's really interesting is when the fault propagated into France, you had a very small region of France that was affected and had a short, um, a, a short um, power cut, basically. France, their generation mix is almost all nuclear, plus a good chunk of hydro, which is another conventional source, so big spinning machines. That means that the French grid has very high inertia, and so the fault didn't propagate into France, except this very small region, and they restored power into that region very quickly. So that just shows the difference between a high inertia grid and a low inertia grid. And here's Paul Marshall, another expert in the field, and I'll allow him to explain to you why renewable energy just doesn't work. Renewables are essentially a parasitic form of energy. Their marginal cost can be theoretically below, be low, but because of their intermittency, they can only function today as part of an energy system balanced by other providers. There are high hopes that this problem will be solved through the development of cheap storage, but that solution has not arrived yet. Hydrogen was once to considered to be the best solution. Now the great hope is batteries. But the most long-life batteries in the world today only have storage capacity for six to eight hours. You see, largely speaking, the big problem here is that Renewable energy isn't consistent. Our entire energy grid relies on consistent supply. If the wind blows too fast and energy is generated too much, it will cause a problem. If there isn't enough wind and the turbines aren't moving fast enough, it'll cause a problem. So you need the wind to be specifically absolutely on point. You need the sun to be specifically absolutely on point. And even in European nations like Spain, that was not achievable. How much worse will that be for South Africa? But you might be saying, wait, 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 Stefan. But what about the cost? Wind and solar is free. So yes, maybe every once in a while we'll have a total blackout, but it's still free. Well, okay, here's Gerard Holland that will explain the cost of renewables. Great. Okay, now when designing a grid, first you have to look at the piece of equipment that's actually generating the electricity. So in the case of renewables, this is your solar panels and wind turbines, and for our purposes, we've gone for a 50-50 split of both. But regardless of which way you cut it, the costs come out roughly the same. In the case of coal, these are our coal-fired power stations, and in the case of nuclear, our nuclear reactors. So here's the scores on the board so far, 304 terawatt hours. But there's more to the story. Generation is bound by a capacity factor. So in, a, in essence, you have the total potential that can be produced, and then you have the actual amount that that piece of equipment is running for. So for on average, a nuclear power runs at a capacity factor of about 90%. Coal's a little bit lower at 70 to 80, and this has been factored into these costings. But renewables are much lower. They are around 32% for wind and 23% for solar. So to actually produce the same amount of electricity as coal or nuclear, you need to overbuild, which now looks like this. Now, the typical lifespan of a nuclear power plant is 60 to 80 years. The typical lifespan of a coal-fired power station is 40. But the typical lifespan of a solar panel or a wind turbine is 20 to 30 years. So let's take our lower bound for nuclear and say over a 60-year period, we have to replace renewables twice. Now let's add in our workers' wages and our operations costs. Now the advantage of wind and solar is that it doesn't require a fuel source, which nuclear and coal do. So over the life cycle, you can expect coal and nuclear costs to look like this. Now notoriously, you have to process and store the spent fuel from nuclear plants. Let's add those costs in. But the advantage of using a fuel source is that you can have 24-hour power. Unfortunately, renewables don't produce electricity when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, so you need storage. Enough storage to power an entire evening. So let's add this storage in, and this is a mixture of pumped hydro and batteries. And of course, batteries need replacing too, and being generous, these can last up to about 20 years, so they'll need to be replaced two more times. So we've just added those replacements in. But batteries don't produce electricity, they only store it. And this is only enough storage to keep the grid going for one night. So what happens if, say, we're in the middle of winter, 
we have low sunlight and a wind drought, and we don't produce enough excess energy to charge our batteries for the following evening. And what happens when, like it did in June 2020, this wind drought lasts for two years? Uh, sorry, two weeks. Um, <laughs> that would be very expensive. One option is to keep all of our existing gas turbines in operation. And that would mean a continued dependence upon fossil fuels, and we'd still have to pay for their replacements, operations, maintenance, and fuel. And in keeping with our net zero commitments, we'd have to offset those carbon emissions with carbon capture storage. But if you want to do it with renewables, then we need at the very least to triple our solar to cover for the lack of wind energy being produced and to produce enough excess to keep our batteries charged. So let's add in another scenario. Uh, so we've got on the left a fully renewable grid, and then just next to that we've got one that keeps gas as a backup. We then have to consider how do we actually get the energy we've generated to the end user. So in the coal, case of coal and nuclear, we can just use our existing sites and transmission in the grid. With renewables, on the other hand, you have to decentralize the grid. And you need transmission not only to the end user, but also hooked up to your storage. So let's add in our additional transmission costs. And then last but not least, we're going to consider our decommissioning costs. So let's add those in. And there you have it. This is what the differing pathways would cost to meet Australia's energy needs over the course of a generation. So even though that scenario is in Australia, it's going to be true here in South Africa as well. It's, in fact, true across the entirety of the world. Every country in the world that has tried to make this green switch to renewable energy has seen only one thing happen. Well, actually two things, if we want to be absolutely specific. First, energy prices have absolutely skyrocketed. And second, industry has absolutely been destroyed. Now, the industry isn't destroyed by the renewables. It's destroyed by the energy prices. And if you're going to reply on renewables, the problem is you're going to have to keep all of the other power sources available. You're still going to need your coal-fired power plants. You're going to need gas to power power plants. Why? Because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And in the moments where the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you need power. So you are ultimately just doing this to pretend. You're wasting everyone's money, everyone's time on a dream that doesn't exist. There is no renewable future. Renewables work amazingly well on rooftops for your house because your house is fine. You can have a battery large enough to supply your house. The second you get to city-wide or even nationwide, the problem becomes exponentially more expensive and due to the insane costs but also capacity constraints, it's just no longer viable. So I say, Mr. Ramakopa, I am on board with the nuclear part of this. Let's build as many nuclear power plants as we can stomach. Heck, let's throw a nuclear power plant in every neighborhood of this country. Let's get free electricity because we are generating so much. Heck, let's supply the whole of Africa with free nuclear energy. Get away from the wind. Get away from the solar. They don't work. They're a waste of time. And we could use all of that money to instead just build more nuclear power plants. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button or dislike button. It's free of charge, and I just still appreciate the views. As always, massive shout out and thank you to all of the patrons, as well as the YouTube channel members, for continuing to support this channel. To become a member, just hit the join button right below this video. As always, be good to each other, be kind to each other, and I will see all of you in the next one. <gasps> A peace.